What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. I am Nicholas. This is Big Dogs Gotta Eat BDGE Fantasy Football. We're refreshing our must own running backs for 2019 fantasy football video. One, because a lot's changed within the last month. Two, because that thing does hella fucking views and brings me in a lot of subscribers. So if you're new to the channel and you enjoy the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. On the last video, we had a few names in there that will drop off the list. And all of these guys are updated throughout the summer in my draft guide on BigDogsDraftGuide.com. We had Marlon Mack in there. And y'all know how much I've loved Marlon Mack this year as a third round pick. I thought he was the best value steal in the entire draft. However, with all this luck news, we don't even know if he's going to end up suiting up for the first week or two of the season. Therefore, there's no way Mac becomes a must-own running back if luck is not on the field. I, I don't care if he's going to get more carries. That offense overall will be a lot less efficient, a lot less scoring opportunities. And what made Mac so appealing was the fact that his rushing floor was so damn high if Andrew Luck was in the lineup. And by rushing floor, I mean rushing touchdown floor, as well as carries and stuff like that. We've seen him take 18 of the 19 first team snaps so far this preseason. So he hasn't come off the field on third downs. It doesn't look like Naeem Hines is going to be the only pass catcher in that backfield. So I like what we're seeing from Mac. If Andrew Luck is ruled healthy to go for week one, he might find himself back on this list. But for now, we're going to take Mac off. We're going to take Rashad Penny off as well. Um, as a couple other running backs too. Rashad Penny, we're seeing Chris Carson absolutely dominate the backfield touches with Russell Wilson under center so far this preseason. Um, and again, if you guys want all of my preseason write-ups, I do a lot of personnel and usage and, and takeaways, the biggest takeaways from the preseason um, each week that is updated in the draft guide within the article that we call the Big Dogs Gotta Eat Bible. So bigdogsdraftguide.com, we take Rashad Penny out because he is not taking that starting job by pure talent. He's only doing so if Chris Carson gets hurt, which is very much a possibility, but I don't think he becomes a must draft just based on what we've seen uh, in terms of usage out of the two Seattle running backs. Nick Chubb was in the last one as well. He is still very much in this one, but I'm not going to go into depth on Nick Chubb again because he is rising up draft boards. And I talked about him in depth in the last video, which I will link up here as well as in the description. So if you want to catch the first version of this video, I suggest doing so. As always, we are doing a draft guide giveaway. And with the giveaway, we have been asking for y'all to answer one of the questions that we put up front in the beginning of the video. I asked you guys, which stack would you like to own most in fantasy football this year? It was Cam Newton and Curtis Samuel or DJ Moore. You get to choose OJ Howard and James Winston or Kirk and Cousins. The winner of this week's giveaway is Marshall Nudson. Yeah, that's a fucking fire name. Marshall Nudson. Kirk and Diggs for sure. Vikings plan. And y'all could read the rest. Congratulations, Marshall. Uh, hit me up via email, which is linked down below or Twitter or Instagram, whatever. Just hit me up some way and I'll get you access to the guide. This week's draft guide giveaway question is, which NFL team that made the playoffs last year is most likely not to make the playoffs this year? Drop that answer down below and why. I need some big facts to back up your answer. And you will automatically be entered into the giveaway. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button down there. Drop that comment down below, that answer, and you're automatically entered into the draft guide giveaway, which I will announce on next Wednesday's video. If y'all enjoy the video, thumbs up, rating, review, subscribe. Let's get into my must draft, must own running backs for 2019 fantasy football. Two other quick announcements before we start off the video. If you're watching this on Wednesday, I will be going to the Fantasy Sports Network studio in Manhattan again today to join them for their two hour live stream at two o'clock, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Go to the Fantasy Sports Network YouTube channel and at two o'clock we will be live, myself and Greg Sussman. I'm not actually sure what we're discussing, to be honest. He hasn't sh sent me over the show sheet yet, but we'll be live on the Fantasy Sports Network. I'll tweet it out and stuff, so stay tuned for that. We also got the Big Dogs Got Eat NYC live draft weekend coming up this weekend, so I will be live, dr live streaming one of my actual drafts, a live draft on Saturday, approximately 1 p.m. Eastern time, so set your clocks, set your watches, tuck your shirt in, stop yelling, and join me for that. First up on this list, Aaron Jones of the Green Bay Packers. He has finally cracked into the must draft, must own running backs for this year. He's going around the third round. 
in fantasy drafts. And he wasn't someone I loved in the beginning of the offseason because there were a lot of outs in which he doesn't become successful in fantasy football this year. They could shove him into a running back by committee. He's shown a lot of health concerns, a lot of durability concerns in this backfield and just throughout his NFL career so far. But what I'm hearing out of Green Bay camp, what I'm seeing from Aaron Jones, all of the reports and everything is looking very, 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 very good. And I will be targeting Aaron Jones in the third round of almost every one of my fantasy football drafts. Now he dealt with this hamstring injury, which kept him out of camp for a little while, as did his teammate Jamal Williams. But Aaron Jones has since returned to camp. I believe it was the beginning of last week. So he's been back at camp for about 10 days. He did not play in their week two preseason game. I'm hoping that we see some action from him in week three. Maybe get that Damian Williams treatment where he plays like four or five snaps with the first team. He really gets his legs under him, gets to run at NFL speed, caliber game speed, and then they put him on ice. That's how you know that he is their starter. This situation overall, right? We have Matt Floor coming over from Tennessee to head coach this Green Bay team. We know the background of, of LaFleur. He comes from the Shanahan tree. He comes from the Sean McVay tree. So he's got some good predecessors in terms of who is teaching him how to run an offense, how to have a higher paced offense, hopefully, than he did with Tennessee last year. But most importantly, throwing to the running backs. We've heard it a few times this summer already. Packers coach Matt LaFleur wants the running backs to be more involved in the passing game. We know that Aaron Jones is the best pass catcher in this backfield. Jamal Williams has been hampered by a hamstring all of August, and I think it goes back into July. He's been out of practice for a long time. He might be back at practice now, but I'm not positive. He hasn't played in any preseason games. I haven't heard any reports of him being back at practice. Dexter Williams has handled the load in these preseason games, but they're giving him a lot of work for preseason. Supposedly, he got like kicked out of a drill at practice the other day because he was not running it correctly or something. So he's not in the best graces of Matt LaFleur right now. It seems like Aaron Jones is backfield completely too use. When you look at what he did in Tennessee last year, how he used Deion Lewis. Deion Lewis had about 215 touches last year, 59 by way of reception. And that was while Derrick Henry was going off and, and getting all the carries over the last five, six weeks of the season. Deion Lewis was still averaging three to four receptions a game, which paced out as still 55 to 60 receptions. Like I said, we know Aaron Jones is the best pass catcher in this backfield. So if there's a running back that's going to get those types of receptions in 2019, it's going to be Aaron Jones. It's not going to be Dexter Williams. It's not going to be Jamal Williams. That is not the strong suit of either of their games. So we know Jones's floor is very high just because of the pass catching work that he's going to get in this offense. But we know he's also the best runner by far and away in this Green Bay Packers offense. He led the entire NFL in yards per carry last year. 5.47 yards per carry, ranking eighth in tackles evaded per attempt. And unlike Deion Lewis, Jones is not competing with Derrick Henry for carries. The running back by committee argument, which we've seen in Green Bay for the last couple of years, is, is a very valid argument. And I almost hope that this happens. I've said this point, I've made this point many times already this summer. And I'm, I'm saying like, I think a lot of teams would benefit from using a running back as Alvin Kamara is used in the Saints offense, not as a workhorse, not as a guy who's going to get 20 to 25 touches, get 65 to 70% of the touches, make sure they're in space, make sure they're not just the grinder role of getting one to two, three yards up the middle. And that's how these smaller backs get hurt. If Aaron Jones can be used in a way where he's getting, you know, 12, 13, 14 carries a game in a very efficient manner, which is what he does along with like four or five targets a game. Fuck yeah. Aaron Jones is going to ball out this year. It gives them a lot less likelihood of getting injured as well with the less touches, more of them coming out in space. Obviously as a receiver or like a scat back, you don't take as many big hits as the guys that are going up the middle. That's Dexter Williams, Jamal Williams can have that role. This is also quietly a very good line in Green Bay. They were football outsiders, seventh best run blocking line and PFF's fifth best run blocking line last year. They drafted a kid named Elkton Jenkins from Mississippi State in the second round to shore up that interior line. They signed Billy Turner from Denver in free agency, four years, $28 million contract. They hired former 49ers O-line coach Adam Stenovich. So LaFleur, LaFleur and Stenovich have the same Kyle Shanahan-esque scheme. They'll be on the same page when it comes to run blocking and, and the scheme that they are running together. This is going to be a great offensive unit in Green Bay on all cylinders. I know that Dr. Morse came on the channel earlier this week and said that he's a little bit concerned about Rodgers. Um, I think he's more concerned uh, about an efficiency standpoint from Rodgers than actual injury because there's been some you know, write-ups about how Rodgers was not that efficient last year despite his touchdown to interception ratio because he holds the ball too long, takes too many sacks. 
But as far as I'm concerned, in fantasy, I would much rather have you take a sack than throw the throw the ball to the other team because then you don't have the ball anymore. If you take a sack, then it's just longer yardage, more passing situations, Aaron Jones getting dump offs. I'm not really concerned about Aaron Rodgers, to be honest. Again, this is going to be a great Green Bay offensive unit that has a lot of scoring opportunities and that should be plentiful. Aaron Jones is a guy who just has a knack for the end zone. Dating back to his college days, 33 rushing touchdowns in 35 career games. Last year, he handled 67% of the Packers' goal line carries and was absolutely dominant inside the 10-yard line. Looking at this tweet, the highest touchdown rate in the NFL on carries inside the 10-yard line. They had to have more than seven carries to qualify. Aaron Jones scored on 75% of his carries inside the 10-yard line. Not another running back was even close to the ratio that he put up. So he led the NFL in touchdown rate and carries inside the 10-yard line turning eight of them into six touchdowns. It's a small sample size, but super efficient. He's just a guy that knows how to get into the end zone. You don't need a grinder back to be your best goal line back. You need guys who are very quick footed, guys who have great vision and guys who can hit that hole really quickly and really hard. And Aaron Jones brings the toughness that can get into the end zone. And you could see that he converts those. And just going back to that number of, of catches by Deion Lewis, 59 receptions. I can't get that number out of my mind. And if Aaron Jones even flirts with 50 receptions, he is going to be an absolute stud in fantasy this year. He has top five upside because I think he has potential to score like 12 touchdowns. Vegas actually has him penned in. I believe his rushing total over under is 1050 or 1100 yards. I know it's higher than David Johnson's. And if he can go off for 1050 or 1100 rushing yards and add 400 to 500 receiving yards, which I should expect if you're going to go and you know catch 50 to 60 passes this year, He's going to flirt with 15 to 1600 total yards and probably double digit to 12 touchdowns. So we love Aaron Jones here at the HQ. He's the first guy up on the must own running backs video. And I know that drafts are rapidly approaching. A lot of you guys probably do drafts with your friends or your coworkers or your families, whatever it is. I want to pass this on to y'all a little tip or trick. And it is a site called teamstake.com. T E a-M-S-T-A-K-E dot com. It'll be on the screen, so disregard my ridiculous spelling of it or attempt at spelling it. Teamsake.com takes out all of the hardships of trying to collect money. It is it is literally like a PayPal or Venmo designed for fantasy leagues. So if you're the commissioner or if your friend is the commissioner or your uncle or your boss is the commissioner of your league, literally just tell them about Teamsake.com. All they got to do is enter few pieces of information and they set up your league on teamstake.com, then they could send you guys the URL on Teamstake. And then you guys could pay through PayPal. You could pay through eCheck or whatever. eCheck has a 0% deposit and payment fee. It's beautiful. It's flawless. It takes all of the work out for the commissioner. If you're a good person, tell the commissioner in your league to use teamstake.com. It is very, very, very customizable. You can customize the payout situation, the buying situation. You can even have late fees if people don't pay by the day of the draft. So sign your league up on teamsake.com. Once you do that, you'll literally just be able to send the URL out to all of your league mates and they could pay flawlessly. So you don't have to worry about collecting cash. You don't have to worry about some of it coming in through PayPal, some of it coming in through Venmo. It is beautiful. I love Teamstake. I love them for sponsoring today's video. Y'all should check it out. It will be linked down in the description as well as pinned in the comments section. Let's move on to must own running back number dose. And that is Miles Sanders of the Philadelphia Eagles. The current running back depth chart for the Eagles basically reads Miles Sanders, Jordan Howard, Wendell Smallwood, Corey Clement, Josh Adams, Donald Pumphrey, Darren Sproles, Boston Sky. It's like actually kind of ridiculous to be honest with you, but no one's getting wrong with the ones outside of Jordan Howard and Miles Sanders. They've been splitting the work evenly throughout the first two preseason games. We have not seen them with Carson Wentz in the lineup yet. So this week three game will be very telling on how they see the split turning out. Jordan Howard started the first game. Miles Sanders started the second game. So it seems like they are already in a near 50-50 timeshare, which is beautiful because Sanders dealt with a hamstring injury in the beginning. And a lot of reports were like in the beginning of the summer. And a lot of reports were like he's got a, a lot of ground to make up. So he's already made up that ground is in that 50-50 timeshare. I don't think anyone expects Sanders to go into the year as the guy getting 80% of the touches. But I think we should, if you're smart, you should expect him to start getting the majority of the workload by about four or six weeks into the season. And then you're going to have a top 15 running back in a top five offense in the NFL. When you look at Miles Sanders as a prospect, second running back off the board behind Josh Jacobs, the only other running back picked within the first two rounds of the draft. Howie Roseman came out and said, Miles Sanders reminds us of, reminds us of other guys that we've had around here. 
Now, Philadelphia, I've dropped this before, has drafted three running backs inside the first three rounds of an NFL draft since 2002. Miles Sanders, LaShawn McCoy, Brian Westbrook. It's pretty telling when he tells you that he reminds them of guys that they've had before and then uses the draft capital of guys that they've seen before go in that range of the draft. Now, we didn't get to see much of Miles Sanders at Penn State during his freshman or sophomore year. He was behind Barkley, of course. But finally, when he got to seize that role in 2018 with Barkley in the NFL, the guy balled out. Over 1,400 total yards from scrimmage, 24 receptions. That's a good enough number to tell me that he is a good enough pass catcher that he can contribute on third downs in the NFL. And this is not, you know, Ohio State or Wisconsin. This is Penn State where they usually have a terrible offensive line, uh, offensive blocking line. It's not just like the next guy up is going to run for 1,500 total yards. Like Miles Sanders was legitimately good in college and had to create a lot of those yards on his own. So we have the college production. We have a great landing spot. Now, is Miles Sanders athletic? Is he big enough, fast enough, quick enough relative to NFL athletes? Survey says, fuck, yes. He blew away the combine coming in with enough size to be considered a starting NFL running back, right? 5'11", um, 211 pounds. He could operate on all three downs. 75th percentile or above in all athleticism metrics compared to other NFL running backs. Where does this leave us in 2019? Yes, it's a tricky spot because he is starting to creep up draft boards. He's like late sixth round. Early seventh round is really ideal with where you'd want to take him because you might not be able to use him for the first you know month of the season. All of the reports at Philly camp have just been phenomenal about how he's been by far and away the best running back on the roster. He is the most talented guy. And you just look at Miles Sanders was a second round draft pick. They traded a sixth round pick to get Jordan Howard. So there's a monster discrepancy there. Am I nervous about them using a running back by committee given Doug Peterson's history? A little bit, yes, but not for long. I mean, you can give Jordan Howard, just like Aaron Jones, you can give that work to Dexter Williams, Jamal Williams, give Jordan Howard the short yardage work, give him the one to two yard runs, give him the first and 10 yard runs up the middle. Don't care about that. What we care about is the passing down work near the goal line. Is Jordan Howard going to get that? Possibly, but I think Miles Sanders, you know, again, contributing 12 to 14 carries plus four to five targets a game will be a monster in this offense. And for those of y'all like he's never going to get, you know, 15, 18 looks a game. Do you remember Josh Adams? That's a guy who's slower than Miles Sanders and much worse in the passing game. Over the last six weeks of the season, Adams averaged nearly 16 touches a game. He came off the field constantly in passing situations because of his lack of versatility, but Miles Sanders is much more versatile than Josh Adams is. And before Jay Ajayi got hurt, he was being used heavily in this offense, getting 15 plus touches a game, if not higher, before he got hurt. So Miles Sanders could absolutely take that role. Do I think he's ever going to get 25 touches a game? I don't think there's going to be a running back that really does that in the Philly offense. But you just have to look at the opportunity overall, just the offense and the amount of scoring opportunities this team should have, the amount of drives they're going to sustain. So they can get a lot of touches going around in this backfield because they'll be able to sustain drives that are 10, 12 plays long. Even if they split that, if he's getting eight snaps per drive, that's going to you know convert into four touches a game, four drives, 16 touches. Like it, it, the, the math is there. He's going to get you know 15 to 18 touches a game by the fourth, sixth week of the season. And you're going to get a top 15 back, top 12 back if things break right. And someone over the second half of the year that can get you into the playoffs and probably win you your fantasy playoffs if things go smoothly for Miles Sanders. So that is running back number two. If you want all of my must-own players, my running backs, wide receivers, quarterbacks, tight ends, all of my rankings, my big board, my positional rankings broken down by tiers, We're talking about my Bible, which is a monster write-up on the general strategy on how to attack your draft, as well as preseason recaps. Um, a ton of the market share reports, a million different other exclusive things that will literally, you don't need to look elsewhere for your 2019 fantasy football draft. This is where you prep. This is where I take all of my best content, wrap it up for y'all and put it together in the Big Dogs Draft Guide. This is all on bigdogsdraftguide.com. So if you never want to watch another video or consume another podcast, you don't have to because this takes all of the legwork out of it. It is available on the phone, it is available on your computer, on your tablet, whatever you want to bring toward you to your draft is accessible anywhere, anytime. Delivered to you from the HQ. Bigdogsdraftguide.com, the only thing you need for your fantasy drafts this year. Third running back on this list is Matt Breida of the San Francisco 49ers. 24-year-old running back who, despite going undrafted, topped 1,050 total yards from scrimmage in his second season. He caught 27 of 31 targets last year, averaged 5.3 yards per carry, the second highest rate in the NFL among 33 running backs with at least 135 carries. The guy is ridiculously efficient 
And let me remind you, he did this all on one ankle last year. Now, everyone was shying away from Brita. He was like a 14th, 15th round running back in best ball draft so far, and I was snagging him everywhere I could. He is my most most owned running back right now in best ball drafts, and I'm so happy about it. Everyone was concerned about this being a crowded backfield because they have Tevin Coleman, they have Jarek McKinnon coming back, but it's no longer crowded because Jarek McKinnon is still not recovered from his ACL tear from over a year ago. He is not ready to play with the team yet, and there are a lot of reports that saying he is probably going to end up on the IR, which means he is out for a minimum the first half of the entire season. So it's two running backs. It's Breida, it's Tevin Coleman, and Breida's going like five rounds later than Tevin Coleman is. Last night, we finally got to see Jimmy G out on the field for the first time. I mean, he looked terrible. That's obviously one takeaway. He might be 100% physically recovered from the ACL tear, but he is not 100% recovered mentally from the ACL tear. You could you, you could tell from the outing last night. Um, I don't look into stats. I don't care about that. But the, but the takeaways are more from a personnel standpoint. Coleman got the start, which is not surprising whatsoever. He is the starter in San Francisco. There's no doubt about that. But Brita evenly split those snaps pretty much. I believe it was like a 45 to 55% snap split with the first team. And what was most encouraging in this offense was just how these running backs were used in the passing game. They didn't see a lot of targets, but the way that they were moving around the field, they were lined up out wide. They were used in pre-snap motion to put them into the slot. They were running wheel routes, which become very valuable from a fantasy running back standpoint. They were used all over the field in the passing game which I think is, a, I mean, that's a huge part of Kyle Shanahan's offense is getting these running backs involved in the passing game. It's such a mismatch putting a guy like Brita, who was one of, I, I believe he hit the NFL top speed last year, according to next gen stats on a single play, like 22 miles an hour, putting him against a linebacker or a safety is just bad news for the defense. So Kyle Shanahan has a great mind for getting these guys open in the passing game. And I am someone who does not think the San Francisco 49ers team is going to be that good. They don't really have clear weapons outside of George Kittle. I know there's a lot of hype on Dante Pettis, but there's been a lot of bad reports coming out of camp. They have two rookies, Debo Samuel, Jalen Hurd, who didn't even run with the ones last night. Marquise Goodwin um, can't stay healthy. It's like, it's it's a lot of upside, hypothetical upside, but Matt Breed has proven that he could do it. And I think he's going to be a monster part of this passing game. And it's a team I don't think is going to be as good as a lot of people think they're going to be. Um, and I think they're going to pass the ball a lot. And in my opinion, straight up, Breed is the most talented back in this backfield and on this roster and the most versatile. Last year, Breida ranked seventh among all NFL running back in yards per touch. His fourth highest yard breakaway run rate, 8.5%, the percentage of runs that went for 15 or more yards. He had zero drops while simultaneously having PFFs, Pro Football Focuses, single highest receiving grade among all NFL running backs last year. He was literally a cheat code on first and second downs through the air. Shanahan knows this. He's one of the top young offensive-minded head coaches in the NFL, and he understands that the cheat code there is getting the ball in space to your running backs on early downs. And again, that's what we saw in the preseason game last night. Those guys moving around in the slot, in motion, running wheel routes, lining up outside. So Tevin Coleman will obviously be, be very involved in this offense, But I'm a believer that McKinnon will almost not have a single impact this year on this offense. And I think Breida is not only the most talented running back in this backfield, just by efficiency measures, production measures, but he's the cheapest in fantasy drafts. So in my opinion, in the 10th round, you have to cop Matt Breida in every single draft. So I love those three running backs, Aaron Jones, Matt Breida, and Miles Sanders. A couple other honorable mentions I want to get into. Tony Pollard of the Dallas Cowboys, yo. If you were drafting James Conner last year because of Le'Veon Bell's holdout, there's no reason, I mean, not to be taking Tony Pollard right now. If you think that the risk of drafting Tony Pollard in the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th round and losing that draft pick if Zeke signs is not worth the risk, you should go ask James Conner owners last year if, if that pick was worth the risk. I mean, we have Zeke in negotiation. When it comes down to it, not a single fucking person on earth knows if Zeke is going to sign, knows if Melvin Gordon is going to sign. You hear like, oh, Zeke's probably going to sign before week one. But what evidence do we have to suggest that? We have no fucking idea if Zeke's going to hold that into the season. It's very possible that he does. Um, And if he does, Tony Pollard is the clear handcuff and running back to own. He's running exclusively with the ones. I mean, we look at preseason week two. Dak Prescott played 13 snaps on Saturday which was the preseason week two game. Tony Pollard took every single one of those. He dominated. He got like six or seven touches on the first team on the first drive, capped it off with a nice, strong 14-yard touchdown run up the middle. This guy is, there's no one else touching the ball in this backfield besides Tony Pollard if Zeke is out. So Tony Pollard is a must-draft player. If 
if the risk of just losing a 10th or 11th round pick is, is the worst that can happen, he's going to be a top 12, top 15 running back that you're getting in the 9th, 10th, 11th round. You can't pass up on Tony Pollard at that price. So snag him in best ball drafts everywhere you can right now. The other guy I absolutely love at his ADP is Deion Lewis, man. I've talked about him a lot. And it's Derrick Henry dealing with this calf strain. Now, he did actually return to practice, I believe, yesterday or the day before, which was the first time in like four weeks since pulling that calf or, you know, dealing with the calf strain, which left him in a walking boot. But he's obviously at a very high re-injury risk um, for the remainder of the preseason. I doubt we'll see him actually get any run in the preseason, which makes me a little nervous because we're not going to see Derrick Henry at all outside of just practice clips and shit like that. Deion Lewis has been the starter there. He's getting involved in the passing game very heavily. He's getting involved as the first down runner. And Deion Lewis, like I said, with Aaron Jones, caught 60 passes last year. Wouldn't be surprising if he did the same thing again. So if Derrick Henry already at a higher re-injury risk rating, I don't think this Titans team is going to be any good. If I was answering the draft guide giveaway question of the day, which team is most likely not to make the playoffs after making it last year, it would 110% be the Tennessee Titans. They're already in a fucking quarterback conundrum in week two of the preseason. There is no, no teams are going to be good that don't have a solidified starting quarterback at week two of the preseason. I mean, it's the Giants, it's the Dolphins, it's the Titans. Like this is going to be a shit show. Marcus Mariota looked looks horrible. He looks hesitant. He looks like he's throwing with a fucking noodle for an arm. It looks bad there. I think this team is going to be trailing a lot. The game script, in my opinion, is not going to favor Derrick Henry, which lends itself to Deion Lewis as the pass catcher. He's still going in like the 13th round because he's a boring play. How fucking boring can you be when you catch 60 passes? You have a phenomenal floor. Derrick Henry is not catching passes this year. Deion Lewis is going to be heavily involved, so I love him as a value pick. He may, maybe he's not a must-own player, but he's an absolute value pick at the end of drafts in 2019 fantasy football. That's going to be it for today's video. Action steps. Answer the draft guide question of the day. Which team that made the playoffs last year will not make it this year and why? You'll automatically enter. If you want to just go cop draft guide right now, if you can't wait till Wednesday because you're drafting within the next week, one, you're probably not going to win because there's going to be a thousand comments, but two, it's worth just, just grabbing it. And, and you know, it's, it's a way to support me. It's on bigdogsdraftguide.com. It's everything you need. Go check out teamstake.com for your league. It's where you need to have your buy-ins set up from now on. I'm the commissioner of like four leagues and this shit helps me out tremendously. So if you enjoyed the video, again, all I ask is that you hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're doing everything 2019 fantasy football from now until the end of the season. Yes, that is a margarita tattoo. What's up?